بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. We have integral x from zero to infinity, the second derivative of the di gamma function with argument one plus x times log x. The di gamma function is minus small gamma, the euler mascaroni constant plus summation over non-negative integer g of one over g plus one minus one over g plus x. The first derivative of the di gamma function is summation g from zero to infinity, one over g plus x squared. The second derivative is minus two, summation g from zero to infinity, one over g plus x cubed. So this part of the integrand is minus two, summation g from zero to infinity, one over g plus one plus x cubed. I replace g by g minus one. Now g is a positive integer. The summand is one over g plus x cubed. Insert this sum into the integral and swap the order of integration and summation. I write the integral as x from alpha to beta, log x over the cube of g plus x. To get the result of interest, we will need to take the limit as alpha tends to zero from above and as beta tends to infinity. Let's focus on this part. Minus two over the cube can be written as d one over the square of g plus x. We do integration by parts. We have log x over g plus x squared. This is log beta over g plus beta squared minus log alpha over g plus alpha squared when we use the limits of integration. We also have minus integral x from alpha to beta, one over g plus x squared times the derivative of log x, which is one over x. We do partial fractions. Here is the verification. We can combine these three fractions with a denominator, g squared x, g plus x squared. In the numerator, we get x times g plus x plus gx minus g plus x squared. From here, we have x squared plus 2gx. If we expand the square and multiply by minus 1, we get minus x squared minus 2gx minus g squared. This integrand is minus g squared over g squared x times g plus x squared, which is minus 1 over x times the square of g plus x. The integral of this part is 1 over g squared log g plus beta minus log g plus alpha, these two terms. The integral of this part is minus 1 over g, 1 over g plus beta minus 1 over g plus alpha. Finally, the integral of this part is minus 1 over g squared between brackets log beta minus log alpha. We need to sum over positive integer g, then take the limits as beta tends to infinity and as alpha tends to 0 from above. Let's focus first on these two terms. Note that 1 over g times g plus beta or g plus alpha, these two quantities are upper bounded by 1 over g squared. The upper bound is not a function of alpha or beta. Moreover, if we apply the sum over positive integer g to the upper bound, we get zeta of 2 by squared over 6, which is finite. This means that for these two terms, we can apply the dominated convergence theorem. We can take the limit inside, then we sum. A version of the dominated convergence theorem is that we have a summation over positive integer g, function h of g and eta. We are interested in the limit as eta tends to eta 0. A sufficient condition that justifies swabbing the order of limit and infinite summation is that the magnitude of h and g and eta is upper bounded by function h tilde that depends only on g and does not depend on the variable with respect to which we are taking the limit. Moreover, it must be the case that if we apply the sum to the upper bound, we get a finite value. This is exactly our situation here. We are justified in computing the limits first, then doing the summation over g. If we take the limit of this part with respect to beta, it is 0, and the sum is 0. If we take the limit of 1 over g, times g plus alpha, as alpha tends to zero from above, this becomes one over g squared. Hence, this quantity is zeta of two. Applying the sum, then the limit to these two terms gives us zeta of two. Let's turn our focus to this term together with that one. We have one over g squared times log g plus beta minus log beta. We can combine the two terms as log one plus g over beta. g and beta are positive. This quantity is positive. We take the limit as beta tends to infinity, so we can assume that beta is greater than or equal to 1. g over beta is less than or equal to g. So log 1 plus g over beta is upper bounded by log 1 plus g. Now we have an upper bound, and this upper bound does not depend on beta. Is the upper bound summable? Yes, we can use the limit comparison test to show that this sum is finite. The sum g from 1 to infinity, 1 over g to the power 3 over 2, is finite because this power is strictly greater than 1. If we take the limit as g tends to infinity of log 1 plus g over g squared over 1 over g to the 3 over 2, we have here g to the power 3 over 2. This limit is equal to 0. Because this sum converges, so does this one. We can apply the dominated convergence theorem, taking the limit with respect to beta inside. The limit is 0. Now to these two terms, we can write this difference as integral u from g to g plus alpha. 2 over u cubed. The magnitude is upper bounded if we replace this u by its smallest value, which is g. 
So we have this magnitude, our bounded by the magnitude of log alpha times integral u from g to g plus alpha 2 over j cubed. The value of this integral is 2 alpha over j cubed. The upper bound that we have is 2 alpha, the magnitude of log alpha divided by j cubed. We take the limit as alpha tends to 0 from above. We can take alpha to be in the interval from 0 to 1. This function of alpha looks like this from 0 to 1. Its maximum is less than 1. Now we have an upper bound that does not depend on alpha. If we sum over positive integer g, we get 2 zeta of 3, which is a finite number. Again, we can apply the dominated convergence theorem. We can take the limit inside, write the sum as 1 over j squared minus 1 over j plus alpha squared all over 1 over log alpha. This is a 0 over 0 situation. We can apply L'Hopital's rule. The derivative of the numerator with respect to alpha is 2 over the cube of j plus alpha. The derivative of the denominator is minus 1 over the square of log alpha times 1 over alpha. The limit of 1 over j plus alpha cubed as alpha tends to 0 is 1 over j cubed. We still have the limit as alpha tends to 0 from above of the square of log alpha divided by 1 over alpha. This is an infinity over infinity situation. We can apply L'Hopital's rule again. We actually have to apply it a third time to get that the limit is equal to 0. The terms that we have processed so far give us zeta of 2. The only two remaining terms are log data over j plus beta squared and minus log j plus alpha over j squared. The logarithm is a concave function. If lambda is a number between 0 and 1, log lambda c plus 1 minus lambda d is greater than or equal to lambda log c plus 1 minus lambda log d. We use here lambda equal to 3 over 4. 1 minus lambda is 1 fourth. C is replaced by j. D is replaced by 3 beta. The logarithm of 3j over 4 plus 3 beta over 4 is greater than or equal to 3 over 4 log j plus 1 over 4 log 3 beta. This is log j to the power 3 over 4 times 3 beta all to the power 1 over 4. If we exponentiate this side and that one, we get that 3 fourth times j plus beta is greater than or equal to j to the 3 over 4 times 3 to the power 1 over 4 times beta to the power 1 over 4. Multiply both sides by 4 over 3. Take the reciprocal of both sides, reversing the inequality, then square. We get that 1 over j plus beta squared is upper bounded by 3 times the square root of 3 over 16, 1 over the square root of beta times j to the power 3 over 2. Multiplying both sides by log beta, we get that the sum over positive integer j of log beta over the square of j plus beta is upper bounded by this sum, which is a finite sum. There is a positive number here, multiplied by log beta over the square root of beta. This quantity is non-negative. It's upper bounded by this quantity here, which tends to zero as beta tends to infinity. So when this is summed over j, it tends to zero as beta tends to infinity. The last term, log j plus alpha, write it as log j between brackets one plus j over alpha, split into two sums. If x is between zero and one, we have this inequality. Log one plus x is less than or equal to x and is greater than or equal to x minus x squared. We can apply these two inequalities to log one plus alpha over j. So log one plus alpha over j is less than or equal to alpha over g and is greater than or equal to alpha over g minus alpha squared over g squared. Divide all sides by g squared. We get finite sums and in the limit as alpha tends to zero, the lower bound and the upper bound tend to zero. This sum here tends to zero as alpha tends to zero from above. In other words, our integral of interest is zeta of two minus summation over positive integer g of log g over g squared. Note that this sum can be obtained via differentiating the zeta function. Zeta of s, when the real part of s is strictly greater than 1, is summation over positive integer g of 1 over g to the power s. If we differentiate this series term by term, we get 1 over g to the power s times log 1 over g. The first derivative of the zeta function, when the real part of s is greater than 1, is minus summation over positive integer g log g over g to the power s. This means that this part here is plus the first derivative of the zeta function evaluated at 2. The second half of this presentation is about writing down this derivative in terms of the glacier Kinklin's constant, A. Log A is the limit as m tends to infinity of summation, small m from 1 to big M, m log m plus big M squared over 4 minus log big M multiplied by the quadratic polynomial m squared over 2 plus m over 2 plus 1 over 12. This derivative is related to the derivative of the zeta function at minus 1. This derivative itself was obtained in a previous video and was shown to be equal to 1 over 12 minus log a. To relate the first derivative of the zeta function at 2 and at minus 1, we start with the Riemann's functional equation. Gamma of s when the real part of s is greater than 0 is integral t from 0 to infinity, t to the s minus 1 e to the minus t. Replace s on both sides by s over 2. Let's do the substitution t equal to x 
by n squared. When we do this exchange of variables and simplify, we get that gamma of s over 2 is pi to the s over 2, n to the s, integral x from 0 to infinity, x to the s over 2 minus 1, e to the minus x pi n squared. This integral is pi to the minus s over 2, gamma s over 2 divided by n to the power s. Sum both sides over positive integer n. The sum of 1 over n to the power s, when the real part of s is greater than 1, is zeta of s. When we sum this side after swapping integration and summation, we get integral x from 0 to infinity, x to the s over 2 minus 1, theta of x. Theta of x is summation over positive integer n of e to the minus x by n squared. So when the real part of s is greater than 1, we have that pi to the minus s over 2, gamma of s over 2, zeta of s, equal to the integral over positive real number x of x to the s over 2 minus 1, theta of x. We make use of the Poisson summation formula, which tells us that summation over integer n of small g of n is equal to summation over integer n of big G of n. Small g and big G are a Fourier transform pair. Specifically, big G is the continuous time Fourier transform of g of t. This is the integral t from minus infinity to infinity, small g of t times e to the minus i 2 pi f t. The ctft of e to the minus pi t squared is e to the minus pi f squared. This is an eigenfunction of the ctft. This result can be derived using complex contour integration. Suppose that g of f is the ctft of g of t. What is the ctft of g of kt, where k is a positive real number? What is this Fourier transform in terms of the Fourier transform of g of t without scaling? Do the substitution u equal to kt. We get integral from minus infinity to infinity, small g of u, e to the minus i 2 pi f over k times u, dt is du over k. The ctft of this time scaled function is 1 over k times big G of f over k. This is the scaling rule for the Fourier transform. So if we know that the Fourier transform of e to the minus pi t squared is e to the minus pi f squared, what is the ctft of e to the minus square root x times t all squared, where x is a positive real number? Here t is multiplied by the square root of x. According to this rule, we have this outside factor, 1 over the square root of x. We need also to replace f by f over the square root of x. The ctft of e to the minus pi x t squared is 1 over the square root of x e to the minus pi f squared over x. According to the Poisson summation formula, if we take this function in t, replace t by the integer n, and sum over n, and if we take the continuous time Fourier transform, replace f by the integer n and sum over n, we also get the same result. The two sums are equal. Let's go back here. On the left-hand side, we have the gamma function and the zeta function. On the right-hand side, we have this integral involving theta of x, which is this summation. In the Poisson summation formula, isolate the term corresponding to n equal to 0, which is 1. And because the summand here is an even function, this sum over integer n is 1 plus double the sum over positive integer n of e to the minus pi x n squared. That is, this part here is 1 plus 2 times theta of x. Similarly, this sum is 1 plus 2 theta of 1 over x. We have a functional identity satisfied by theta of x. 1 plus 2 theta of x is 1 over the square root of x times, between brackets, 1 plus 2 theta of 1 over x. Rearranging the terms, we get that theta of 1 over x is the square root of x minus 1 all over 2 plus the square root of x times theta of x. We take the right-hand side here, split the integral into two integrals, the first integral is from 1 to infinity. The second integral is from 0 to 1, here written using the dummy variable of integration y. In this second integral, use the change of variables y equal to 1 over x. We get an integral from 1 to infinity. The integrand becomes x to the minus s over 2 minus 1 times theta of 1 over x. We can replace this part by the result that we got from applying the Poisson summation formula. Both integrals are from 1 to infinity, so we can combine them. Theta of x is still there. It is multiplied by this bracket. We also have integral x from 1 to infinity. 1 half x to the minus s over 2 minus 1 half minus 1 half x to the minus s over 2 minus 1. Under the original assumption that the real part of s is strictly greater than 1, we can integrate both terms and get the result 1 over s times s minus 1. This is equal to pi to the power minus s over 2, gamma of s over 2, zeta of s. 
replace s on both sides by 1 minus s. This quantity remains exactly the same when s is replaced by 1 minus s, thereby indicating that this function of s is equal to pi to the power minus between brackets 1 minus s all over 2, gamma of 1 minus s over 2 times zeta of 1 minus s. What we got here is an analytic continuation of the zeta function that is valid beyond the constraint that the real part of s is strictly greater than 1. The integral that we have in our expression is actually finite for every value of s. And the reason for this is that we can show that theta of x is upper bounded by a positive constant times e to the minus by x over 2. Noting that our integral starts from 1, not from 0, we get convergence for all values of s. Differentiate both sides of this functional identity with respect to s. Differentiating pi to the s minus 1 half, we get the function itself times log pi. The derivative of zeta of 1 minus s is minus the derivative of zeta evaluated at 1 minus s. We also have to differentiate this ratio. We have minus 1 half, the first derivative of gamma of 1 minus s over 2, times gamma of s over 2 minus 1 half, gamma of 1 minus s over 2, the first derivative of gamma evaluated at s over 2. In the denominator, we have gamma of s over 2 squared. This quantity can be written as the ratio of the gamma functions. Inside the brackets, we have minus 1 half times this ratio, which is di gamma of 1 minus s over 2, minus 1 half times this ratio, which is di gamma of s over 2. This expression here establishes a relation between the first derivative of the zeta function at s and the first derivative at 1 minus s. If we use s equal to 2, the first derivative at 2 is related to the value of the first derivative at minus 1, which is 1 over 12 minus log e, the glacier Kentlin's constant. In a previous video, we obtained zeta of minus 1 as minus 1 over 12. Gamma of 1 is 1. Gamma of minus 1 half, using the property that gamma of z plus 1 is equal to z gamma of z, is gamma of half divided by minus 1 half. Gamma of 1 half is the square root of pi. This is a series representation of the di gamma function. If z is equal to 1, we obtain that di gamma of 1 is minus a small gamma. For di gamma of minus 1 half, we replace this z by minus 1 half. Isolate the term corresponding to g equal to 0. This gives us 1 minus 1 over minus 1 half. That's 1 minus minus 2 or 3. Then write the sum as integral t from 0 to 1, t to the g minus t to the g minus 3 over 2. Interchange summation and integration and sum the geometric series. We get integral t from 0 to 1, t minus 1 over the square root of t, all over 1 minus t. Use the change of variables, u equal to the square root of t. We have integral u squared minus 1 over u times 2u divided by 1 minus u squared. When we multiply by u, we get u cubed minus 1, which is u minus 1 times u squared plus u plus 1. Downstairs, we have 1 minus u times 1 plus u. This ratio is minus 1. If we divide, we get 1 plus u squared over 1 plus u. Subtract 1 and add 1. We get 1 plus 1 over 1 plus u plus u squared minus 1 over 1 plus u. That's u minus 1. Integrating, we get that di gamma of minus half is minus a small gamma plus 2 minus 2 log 2. Now we know everything here. The second derivative of the zeta function is equal to zeta of 2 times this bracket, which has a small gamma minus 12 log a plus log 2 pi. Our integral of interest, which is equal to zeta of 2 plus the first derivative of zeta at 2, is equal to zeta of 2 times the bracket. That is exactly this plus 1. Our integral of interest is in terms of zeta of 2 log 2 by the constants of Euler-Mascaroni and the glacier Kentlin.